<laughs> you know, I feel like the producers and showrunners of Mayfair Witches decided to take any of the goodwill that they had from me for the last two episodes, which were solid, and crap all over them with this season finale. Just one big steaming pile of crap. Hello, everyone. Terrence here with Hollywood Already Did It. If you haven't already, go ahead, like, share, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, ring that bell below. Anytime we have something, you will be among the first to know. My way, Mayfair Witches, folks, uh, one of the highest video watches that I have on this channel. There's no way that I can not finish off and cap off this season with you. Uh, it's taking a minute, taking a minute to get there, but I'm here and we're going to talk about it. Uh, mainly because I'm a completist and I don't want to leave anybody who was, who may have been waiting for this. In a lurch. Um, I like the last two episodes. Uh, I like the one previous to Tessa a lot more, but the one with Tessa was was pretty solid as well. So I felt like we were getting some momentum to at least, while I did not like most of the season, to at least have the season finale kind of go off uh, with a bang and at least pique my interest to maybe return to this in season two, which has been greenlit. It does not. Uh, this is a bad episode of television. This is just a bad episode of television. It's an even worse uh, season finale. It's very rushed. It is very rushed in a way that I have not seen done on television in quite some time. And it makes me now even mad, more mad at the rest of the season. Because there's a lot of episodes where things that you wanted to explain and delve into in this could have been stretched out and, and, and placed earlier in the season. Uh, I'm assuming that the book readers, the finale of this or the final piece of this is what happens in the book. Uh, I don't, I've never read the book, but I have, I stand by the fact that you don't, to make a good television series, you don't need to have watched the material that was made on. You just need to make a good TV series. And from what I've heard from my book readers, this does neither. Let's dive in. Um, the episode begins at the end of last where Keith, the one surviving member who shot Tessa um, before Rowan started calling on off to last Lasher, is running through the woods, just running through the woods uh, and Rowan is chasing after him. She's pretty banged up. She's bleeding out, shoulders hurt. Um, she got a cut on her hand. She's without much energy. And then Lasher appears to her, says, yo, tag me in coach, put me in, let me go get him. Uh, and she's like, cool. Yes, go do so. Um, and she passes out there. It's at that point where Lasher finds Keith hiding in a cabin because he thinks that's a good idea <laughs> after all the stuff that he just saw Rowan do. Neither here nor there. He's in the cabin and uh, Lasher approaches it and then uh, Rowan transfers herself. They do the white eye thing for each other. Um, and so she's use, using him as a vessel um, and she gives him the okay, like, yeah, no, do it. Set him on fire. Um, and so he does. And Keith is burned alive. We then see Cortland with his daughter um, having a conversation. And she's just kind of like, well, got off the phone. Tessa's dead. Uh, and everybody else is dead there. And we can't find Rowan. And so the calls about looking for Tessa have come and they, they found the body. And Cortland's kind of like, well, where's Rowan? Where's Rowan in all this? And Tessa and his daughter's like, well, I, I'm curious, why are you so concerned with what's happening with, with Rowan? Like, why is she so important to you? He just dismisses him, sort of throws her away, and he gets on the phone and makes a call. And in that call, he saw him in the head of the telemask and be like, hey, going down, I got to go find her, blah, 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 putting, putting things in place and saying, hey, I think it's, the prophecy is, seems like it's being fulfilled. I'm going to go see where she's at because right now she's, she's lost. Um, it is at that point in time when uh, his the Cyprian boss comes over to him while they're still on the bridge looking at it. He's like, hey, no, I see the fire. Looks like everything is going according to plan. Sip tries to um, use his power on his boss, mm -hmm. but his boss has the power himself. Comes to find out his boss has basically got the men in black power without the little red flashy thing. Um, he has the power to erase memories and erase mind. Some guy Cyprian feels like, oh, you've probably done this to me before. This is where the episode starts falling off for me. It's already falling off because I think this, this all looks cheaply made. <laughs> it's a very poor, rushed job. Things that 
looked like there was much more care put into the beginning of the season. It looks like they're like, hey, whatever the hell happens, I don't have the money anymore. Just do whatever. We get an exposition dump uh, by words. Things that would have been much better shown to us or put into earlier episodes. Cyprian just word vomits out explanations for things that they want us to buy. In this, um, we quickly get the answers to all the stuff that we kind of wanted earlier in the season. We find out that um, Cortland is the one who is responsible for killing Deidre and that the Telemasca boss of Mr. Eraser um, is the one who helped clean up the whole situation. How everybody was able to forget at the, uh, at the hotel, he is responsible. That. So they've been working in tandem to sort of make this thing happen, to sort of push Rowan towards this. And so instead of doing any like actual work or detective work or any type, we just kind of like, oh, cool. Fip just got all of that by just realizing things as opposed to us spending four episodes of him kind of looking around and searching around and being stuck in some room in Suzanne's brain, Suzanne slash Lasher's brain. He just now like, oh. You know, this all makes sense because this is a season finale. I have to tell you everything right now in this 10 minutes because we only got 30 minutes left in this episode. But to that point that his boss tells him like, hey, I got to erase your brain now. You're not going to remember any of this. So I don't know why we, we, we keep talking. And Chip try to buy himself some time. Like, well, I'm a part of this prophecy. She's carrying my kid. And he's like, oh, well, then I'm going to let you be. I'm going to send you with my agent here and go Go to her, but just let you know we're keeping an eye on you. Sure. I mean, don't, don't. Considering that Cortland and the head of the Telemasca are so well versed in this prophecy, wouldn't they know that having Cyprian be alive for this prophecy, would they know already if he is or is not a part of this? Like, I, I, this lineage of who is aware of the prophecy. And who is not is paper thin. Um, did Carlotta know? Because uh, I feel like she was just doing things kind of on her own. Like, what was the point of all of it? None of it makes sense. Um, or is not explained in, a, in enough detail to allow me to be satisfied with what we're, get, what we're being spoon fed. But then Lasher returns to uh, Rowan, who's still in her mortal form, still just laid out on the ground in a bad way. Um, Trying to heal herself, she can't do it. Although, again, this is where I don't really understand what Lasher's power level is, but now I get it. He's trying to sort of set up a situation, but just fix her. Uh, who has powers and when they can use powers and when they can't use them is never really fully explained. In this. So you just kind of got to go with it. Um, but Lasher takes Rowan into sort of this dream state. Um, and in this dream state, he takes her back to Suzanne's old place and where it all began. This is where you sort of start seeing the prophecy. Um, and it's sort of explained to Rowan that she's the 13th witch. Um, and that's supposed to mean a lot to her. It shouldn't, but yeah. Um, and that she's the only one who can read the, the signage that's sort of happening around Suzanne's place. Um, that it's all been sort of this destiny to make her um, put her here make her this all-powerful being. A side story that's kind of happening that doesn't get an end in this episode, but probably means more in the future. Um, Cyprian's sister uh, is rummaging around his loft and trying to find something to, to, to get a calling card to ask where her brother's whereabouts are. Because she's given, she's given birth to her surrogate kid, and Cyprian's supposed, Cyp supposed to be there, but he wasn't. So now she's kind of confirmed, like, uh, there's some important things that he promised to be there for, and he's not around. So something's happening. Um, and last he saw, last she saw, he was off running around behind Rowan. So he's like, this isn't, she's like, she's probably in a bad way, effing around with these Mayfairers. She found the car, calls, um, and kind of just word vomits out, like, hey, yo, my brother's gone. I know what's going on. I know that, that um, one lady came to come heal. The operator calls like, hey, yo, we got a breach. At that point, uh, Sip's boss from the Talamasca and the lady that healed him and put him into that dream state uh, come and they do an erasure, men in black on her, and erase her brain and kind of sit her out um, so that she no longer remembers what 
all is entailed. In this dream state, Rowan unlocks some things and she becomes pretty all powerful in that. She learns how to heal herself. And in that, she's like, hey, if I can heal myself, can I heal others? And Lasha says some poetic stuff like, yeah, you, you can do all things. And now, because I control the elements, you can control the elements too. Sure. Okay. She then, in this dream state, makes love to Lasha. Uh, and she stays around. She chooses to stay there for a while. Look, I think the belief or what is supposed to be conveyed to me at some point in time in this season is that there is a certain willingness of Rowan to play on the side of being mad. Like she likes to dibble her, dabble her, her toe in the water of being a little uh, unhinged, a little bit of madness. I think for that to work, we need to see that earlier. As much as I like Alexandra Daria, I think she's doing a, 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 a decent job here. I think she's a good actress. I don't know if she's the person that is right to convey that unhinged madness going back and forth. Like, will she, won't they? Um, it's more of a I'm in fear all the time type of thing that's occurring. And because of that, the conveying of her being so willing to just be like, all right, well, now I'm going to sleep with Lasher in this dream fate doesn't make sense. It doesn't read. It just feels like, well, wait, what? I, I thought she liked Sip. I thought she was in love with Sip. Um, and to sort of say, hey, she's under his control, for her to be as powerful as she is, something here isn't jiving with what us as the audience is to believe and how quickly this all of a sudden, like, I was legit like, wait, did I miss a reel, a piece of this scene where how she's all the way, well, I want you. <clears throat> See, well, that's just straight up asking, well, what else do you want? And she just starts taking off his clothes. And I'm like, well, how did we get here? I, I don't know how this is correct outside of the story keeps telling us it's a prophecy and we're supposed to accept that. Um, is there something with this newfound power that she's been given that just makes her fall in love with Lasher? Like it, I, I don't understand this. What we then see is a matter of sort of like the seventh sign for this Rosemary's baby type thing that's kind of happening here is uh, Sip approaches Cortland's daughter and word vomits out to her because there's no other way to, to do this because you didn't explain any of this in the season or let some of these seeds come out in the season. You just have to do it all now. But he tells her that, hey, Cortland raped Deidre. Um, and when he was looking around the office, he saw knickknacks, and that's how he's able to find this out. So, you know, Cortland, Cortland raped Deidre, and he is Rowan's father, Rowan's her sister, uh, and that's why he's so protective of her. Um, he has put in place... Uh, Rowan to be this 13th witch and on the behest of Lasher. So he is the mortal father of, uh, of Rowan, while Lasher was the supernatural one. So he's been working with Lasher this whole time to do so. In the spirit realm now, Lasher is, um, has impregnated Rowan again. And so what they're learning and what everybody's kind of saying is that the witching hour is that the, the short amount of time that Rowan has to actually be, be pregnant. Um, it's not the ninth mo nine month gestation. It's a, a day, like within hours, she's going to give birth to a, a child. And so Rowan wakes up in her dream state uh, and Lasher has gone and he's impregnated. Her stomach just continues to get larger in a, in a rapid amount of time. And he's torturing her and testing her and moving her around to places where he's putting her in a situation where her spiritual body ends up in the Mayfair mausoleum uh, while her mortal body is being pulled there by Cortland. Cortland has grabbed her and put her in there uh, and then puts her in a dress and all of a sudden she becomes pregnant and given and having a massive belly on this table at the Mayfair mausoleum. Again, all of this, I'm, I'm, I'm okay if all of this occurs, you got to space this out. All of this to happen in 40 minutes and we're just kind of like being told things left and right just feels like it's a whiplash. So then when we come to realize that the prophecy um, is all about the 13th witch being the person to bear Lasher from the spirit realm and make, give him a mortal 
mortal-esque, but to give him a human form, like to birth him into the, the real world so that he can cause, they can cause a one-two havoc in the real world. That's the whole point of all of this. Um, and so this pregnancy is happening so that R Lasher is basically impregnated her in the spiritual war realm to speed up the process of the pregnancy that she has with Cyprian in the real world so that then this witching hour moment can happen. So she gets to the Mayfair ma mausoleum and Suzanne shows up in the spirit realm, but in the, in the real realm, it's just Rowan by herself giving, looking like she's giving birth. So Cyprian, not Cyprian, uh, Cortland's watching the, in the, in the background while this is all happening. And Suzanne meets her and says, nope, this is, this is what we're, what the hall, the plan was this whole time. But we won't explain any of it to the audience. We'll just say it was always a prophecy. We'll spend about five episodes talking about the prophecy and never actually delve into it until the final episode. Suzanne helps and gives birth to uh, a baby, which is got powers, I guess, or will have powers and, and gives Rowan a capability of doing all, <laughs> controlling elements and controlling healing and all of that stuff together. Um, she is now pretty all powerful. Baby comes out crawling already. Um, and Cortland is, uh, is trying to press upon Rowan that he should give the baby, she should give the baby to him. Because she's not, she's not going to know what to do with it. At this point, Rowan is delved fully into madness. Don't know how we got there. And it's also not conveyed really well. Um, this is where I sort of get back into the Good of an actress as Alexandra is, I feel like if we were going to do this madness thing, we needed to have hints of her towing the side of the dark side much sooner, much earlier than the final episode. Um, but to do all of this, to get all of this done, um, Cortland was promised eternal life, immortality. And so Lasher, baby, the baby Lasher, uh, grants that to him. And what's weird is that he's like, oh, I can feel that I'm immortal. I Sure. Um, I don't know if he just feels like his ALS is gone, but he's like, nope. Ah, I've been granted immortality. It feels good to be ever living. Huh? You've done nothing to even test that you are ever living. We're just supposed to accept that in the script says you're ever living. All of a sudden, okay. Uh, Rowan combats his, his eternal life by saying, okay, cool. You're going to live forever, but you're not taking my baby and I'm turning you into stone. So you get to live forever in stone form, but you're not. You're not affecting me anymore. She tries to leave the mausoleum, and then that's where Cyprian is there with his umbrella, trying to be like, hey, that's our baby. And Rowan's like, nope, I'm a mama now. I'm a baby. I got a baby. He's like, yeah, I know. That's my kid. And dialogue and everything is terrible. They go back and forth. Um, it is apparent that Cyprian is trying to separate Rowan from the baby. It's like, hey, let me take the kid. Let me take the kid. She's like, no, you're not taking my kid. And then she starts flipping out and kind of like throwing throwing lightning or at least thunder to kind of show that she's serious. Um, and they are now at odds and fall apart. She feels that Sip is trying to take the baby back to Talamasca. And he's like, she's like, nah, that ain't happening. Um, speaking of Talamasca, something that leads to nothing, but because Sip's sister was, was, had just given birth and, um, was pregnant. And then the throwaway line, they kind of asked him, she comes up, did you just give birth? The only reason now they, they put that line in there is to say that, oh, she's formerly pregnant. Maybe we can hold her hostage and use her lactating milk once we get a hold of the baby. Sure. I, okay. All right. What the hell is happening? Then we just see Rowan walk off into the rain saying, you can't control him and you can't control me. And that is how the season ends. The disjointed mess. Um, it's a rushed mess, disjointed. And now that I've seen the entire thing, and, I, and the, the book folks may have known this is where this is always going with uh, the purpose of trying to bring Lasher into the mortal world. Now it feels like not only was Lasher not the person cast correctly, but neither was Rowan. Because there needs to be some unhinged aspect to this to sort of make the flip from like, I love Cyprian. I'm always confused. I'm confused. I'm scared. I'm confused. I am mad. In the final episode, it just doesn't click. It doesn't work at all. It all feels rushed. 
we have two moments of just exposition dump to explain things that should have been explained over the course of the season. The whole raping thing, which kind of we kind of knew something was up with that. But the whole raping situation and him being the father of Rowan could have come out earlier so that we can deal with a little bit more, more of the meat and potatoes of who knew the prophecy, who else in that family was aware of what was going on. Did Car Carlotta know? There are a lot of questions that are left on the table that just don't get answered. And I don't care. <laughs> like, it seems like the, the, the showrunners and the producers don't care to explain this to me. So now I no longer care about trying to figure it all out. This was um, kind of a wasted exercise. I think the first couple of episodes started strong, strong-ish anyway. Um, and I think the two episodes right before this were solid. They weren't great. Um, some of that is because they were solid because the things that came right before them were so bad. They're like, ah, this is better than that. Um, but we have now regressed back to a season finale that just feels limp, um, uh, unearned, and weak. It just feels like it's lazy. Lazy writing, lazy storytelling, lazy effects, lazy everything about this season finale was lazy. And for this to be a part of the Anne Rice um, Immortal Universe, oh, you pale terribly in comparison to Interview with the Vampire. Um, and I, I feel bad that they're getting a second season and this is getting a second season um, and that they still have to share sort of the same world because nothing here feels like it is de dealt with with the same care, uh, honor, and time that that show, that Interview with the Vampire takes. This is just bad. And I... I love the views. I do. I love the views that, and I love the folks that have been watching these Mayfair Witches ones and, and sticking around and, and seeing what I had to say. I can guarantee you I'm not watching season two now. I'm not. Uh, this was so bad. <clears throat> I thought the last two episodes were like, hey, maybe this will bring me back around. This episode was such a bad piece of television. I, I'm out. So it's been fun with the folks that have been watching um, who, who came on for Mayfair Witches. I wish you guys all the best, but I can't do it. What did you guys think about this season finale of Mayfair Witches titled What Rough Beast? Uh, leave your thoughts and comments in the comments below. If you haven't already, you can follow us on Twitter at Hollywood ADI. You can hit us up on email at HollywoodAlreadyDidIt at gmail.com. We also have a podcast by the same name that's on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that plays podcasts. We're there. Like always, I got my ticket. You got yours. <laughs>